Brilliant, thank you. It's always so much easier to be rude in print, isn't it? <laughs> um, and also, I'm, um, I know so much more about civic tech now than I did 24 hours ago. Um, so, the digital divide. Um, 4.2 billion people in the world do not use the internet. Um, and that is more than people who do. So, if you're interested in that, then, of course, you need to understand that more than half of the people in the world cannot use the internet at all. Um, this is really great. So hopefully this is on your ogre, <laughs> um, the research from the World Bank. Um, and uh, the breakdown of the top 20 countries where those 4.2 billion people live is really fascinating as well. More than a billion of them live in India for starters. But if you go, go all the way around to about number 18, um, you'll find that country, the United States of America. So in the US, 51 million people don't know how to use the internet. And that's just a little bit more than Tanzania and just a little bit less than Vietnam. So if you think this is just an, an, an issue that happens out there in those other places in the world, then actually this is actually quite close to home. So Tinder Foundation, um, we're a staff-led mutual and charity. Uh, we're based in the UK, and almost all of our work is in the UK. We're just beginning to do some work um, in the Philippines and in Australia. Um, and since 2010, we've helped more than 1.8 million people in the UK to develop basic digital skills. Um, our belief is a world where everyone benefits from digital, and it's not about digital skills per se, it's about the change in people's lives once they have that platform. So to see digital as a platform for them to tackle those other social issues that they have within their lives. I thought you might want to know who funds us. So in 2011, we spun out of a public body. Um, it gives us quite a unique position um, between the public sector and the charity and non-NGO um, sector. Uh, we had one contract with the Department for Business Innovation and Skills, and I'm pretty proud that four and a half years later, we've got contracts with all of these people here. We've just got a, a really good contract with um, Google to help small businesses. Um, and that money helps us to develop our model, but also to work in partnership with a network of hyper-local partners that I'll talk about in a moment. Once a year, we publish an infographic about the digital divide in the UK. Um, it's really important to understand that digital exclusion exacerbates the other exclusions that people experience. So digital exclusion and social exclusion go absolutely hand in hand in countries like the UK and the US and Australia and others like that. Um, up in the left-hand corner, you'll see that the people who don't use the internet are the people who have no qualifications, they're older, they're disabled, um, and they are on low incomes. Because they're excluded from digital, they're excluded from connectivity with other people, um, they're excluded uh, from, um, from jobs, from savings. Um, in the UK, we've got a massive push to put public services online. And of course, the people who are socially excluded and digitally excluded are the people who use public services the most. Um, and they're also excluded from uh, the £100 million a year that the NHS is um, investing in England in improving um, self-efficacy around um, health uh, in, in the UK. The reasons why people are not online in the UK is very similar to everywhere else. The, the, the numbers would be different, but it's motivation. They don't understand the relevance. It's not for people like me. They don't have the skills and the confidence, and they don't have access. In the UK, though, we're relatively lucky that we've got relatively good broadband access. And so less than 1% of people say they don't ever use the internet because they don't have broadband. And so I think it's really important to understand that, as was said yesterday, it's not build it and they will come. You know, if you've got great pipes with super fast broadband running down your street, it doesn't mean if you have low education, low income, low aspiration that you're going to then use that broadband. 
but access isn't enough. So often people say to me, oh, you know, let's just get super fast broadband everywhere, and hey, click, job done, silver bullet. It's not true. And digital literacy isn't enough either, because um, as we know from our lives, once you have the skill, it doesn't mean you then go on to use it. So digital literacy, the skills, what can you do? Uses, uses, what do you do? And outcomes, what you, did you get out of this? And this is what drives all of the work that we do. So put that into context. You know how to do email. You know how to fill in online forms. You know how to upload something into an email. What do you do with that? You apply for a job. You're long-term unemployed. You use those skills to apply for a job. And the outcome is you get a job. You then have more money. You then feel more connected to your society. And everything that we do at Tinder Foundation, we measure through outcomes, so digital outcomes, of course, but also economic outcomes and health and social outcomes. And so every single program, whether a funder asks for it or not, we build these outcomes in and we measure absolutely everything. Um, because we have data, we collect a lot of data around the digital outcomes and then we do a lot of survey work, we do deep, deep dive action research. And to be honest with you, I was driven by two things when I put research in absolutely at the core of the work that we do. One was because I knew that funders would want evidence. It was as cynical as that. You know, like, it's all very well me going around telling people how amazing we are and, you know, how transformational all the stories are, all the people that I meet, but actually evidence really does help tick those boxes. But then also I wanted to know if we were wasting our time. Now, I wanted to know that when we go out there and we do work and we work with partners and we do delivery, that actually it does make a difference and that's massively important. Um, it's important about changing people's lives, but it's also important about trying to translate that impact into monetary um, outcomes. And so this is one thing that we did for the government. So the first one million people we helped in a digital inclusion project, not an employment project, a digital inclusion project, then we found that 84,000 of them went from long-term unemployment into employment. The cost saving for the government after the first year of those people being in work is 678 million pounds. So numbers like this helps us to get a bit more money some of the time from some of the people that we, we show this to. Our model is local and digital, and I think this is a massive message for you guys. Um, it's a blend of face-to-face -face support and online tools. So the face-to-face -face happens with 5,000 partners, hyperlocal partners all over the UK, public libraries, community centres, public housing, cafes, schools, village halls. Um, these buses here, they're run by a public housing association that not only have got computers on board, but they're also Wi-Fi hotspots. They go and park on estates where low-income households are. We're not a franchise network. We don't run them. We don't fund them. It's like a big club with a shared vision. So although some of these people, some of the time, do get grant money from us, actually that's all about together delivering programs. <coughs> And our main digital tool, although we have many, is Learn My Way. So this is an online learning platform. So what we do is we take people who know nothing about the internet and we help them to learn how to use the internet by using the internet. I know it sounds a little bit, you know, oxymoronic, um, but that's the best way to do it because we get that data. But also they're practicing what they know, what they're going to be using whilst they're learning. Um, and uh, Learn My Way is just going through a... a a, a refresh, but um, and it's all mobile optimised and it's all free and people all over the world just find it and use it, which is great. And we also have an English language programme called English My Way for teaching settled migrants in the UK who don't know how to speak English to learn English in a similar model. But of course it works because of that blend of the face-to-face -face partners who can use these tools in any way they like for the people that they're helping, be they disabled, be they older, be they unemployed, be they people who don't speak English as a first, lang as a first language. Right, I've got a film, so this is the difficult bit where I show I can't actually use technology myself. Okay, let's...
My name's Edward, I'm 58 years of age now. I've been out of work for quite some time. It's an absolutely depressing life. Each day you just feel like you're going further and further and further down. And come to learn about basic computer skills. I couldn't even switch one on, to be honest. I was so, I'm just scared of it. As soon as I came on with this, this course, it just, I don't know, straight away I felt comfortable. If you want to learn about computers, definitely go with Learn My Way. I feel like I'm going to get a job to do it. That's the way I look now. You know, it's gonna, that's going to get me a job. That's going to get me back into work. My husband's got prostate cancer and leukaemia. He started having a lot of back pain. I thought it was spine, but apparently it's to do with your prostate. Anyway, it's got me worrying because I know it's not something else that he's getting. Every house needs a computer just for health channels. Oh, English, English, karo etle pachi mara mara bachcha nos college college ma jaine bolu hoy to bolu saku. Me jar thi cooking learning gayi vi jar thi mane gano faido theyo. Me shop ma jaun college par jaun to mane bolu saarut lage chhe. Mara thi thai side thai sakhe chhe. The member bein loko bolu saara chhe. Loko sate baat chit karo saaro lage. Loko sate English ma thoro thoro bolu saaro lage. Boli sakai. कॉन्फिडेंस है यो कि बाहर की विरीते बोलो आनो की विरीते बर लोगों साथे ज्वाइंट करो आनो थैंक यू वेरी मच आई थिंक द स्टार्ट ऑफ माय होमलेसनेस बिगन आफ्टर द ट्रैजिक लॉस ऑफ माय ब्रदर एंड आई थिंक दैट्स व्हेन आई स्टार्टेड यूजिंग ड्रग्स आई रियली वाज लास्ट इन अ न्यू एनवायरनमेंट � rough sleeping, sofa surfing, the training, the IT, um, discovering new account lines and just running with it. And it was the support that made me feel or feel encouraged that yes, I can actually recover from this in a, in a wholesome way. And I um, actually applied for the role formally as a volunteer teaching the same online skills that I use to get my foot on that ladder of learning leading towards me coming into my new role which is a job coach marrying all those elements creates a better person a, a well person I'm really lucky because I go out and I meet these people in my job and um, if I ever feel like I'm not quite sure what to do next week I go out and I talk to some more of them and you can tell from what they're saying they all talked about the face-to-face -face support that they got they all talked about their sisters and the people around them in those centres but they also talked about those outcomes how their lives are now better and not just about, you know, the pursuits of the middle class. It's not just about, you know, ordering my pizza because I can't be bothered to go out in the rain. This is about, you know, women being able to talk to their, their, their children's teacher for, for, for the first time and their children are teenagers. It's about a homeless man who is now helping other homeless people to find work and to get off the streets. This is real, deep challenges that people who are digitally excluded are suffering and that by giving them these skills and giving them the support to use it and um, then really changes their lives. So the other thing I want to talk about is I know a little bit about is digital democracy. So um, this lovely man in his robes is the speaker of the House of Commons. Um, he's called John Burko. He's actually quite a nice chap and that is a uh, hallowed chamber, the House of Commons chamber. Um, the speaker is allowed to set up a commission. Um, most speakers don't. Um, and if you do it, you do it once in your whole um, time as a speaker. And John Burko decided to do it on digital democracy. So good on him that he thought that that was an important thing to do. And the reason he did it was because he knew these stats. You know, the men more than women um, participate and vote. Um, Middle-aged people are much more likely to be involved, although older people are much more likely to vote. Um, and as you go down the socioeconomic groups, um, it's much less, much, much, much less likely that you're going um, to participate in any kind of political activity and or vote. Um, the other thing that John Burko saw was that um, more people were on Facebook than um, voted in the general election. Um, and uh, he said, and, and of course, 
30 million people and 35 million people doesn't mean there are 5 million people on Facebook who uh, didn't vote. It probably means there are you know, 15 million people on Facebook who didn't vote. And so John realised that there was this overlap, um, there was this opportunity to try and find the people who were online who weren't, weren't participating. And one thing I just want to point out about this is that 30 million sounds like a good number, but it is only 62%, and that was quite a high turnout for UK politics. So that still means that 38% of people didn't even vote, and voting is the, the thing that people are most likely to do with any kind of political engagement. We came up with five headline recommendations. Parliament needs to make sure that people understand it, that it should be interactive and digital. There should be a new online forum. Um, online voting by 2020 was the one that got all of the headlines, and I was mightily annoyed about that because we did a lot of work um, to do this, and everyone went, oh, you can't do online voting, it's not secure. Um, and then the last one is about open data that you guys will be really excited about. Um, to come up with these headlines, we did loads of roundtables and consultation with people. Um, I made sure that I went out and met people. Um, I went to a fish and chip shop in Stockport where some of the young people who were there were paid by their employer to take part in the roundtable because they thought it all sounded terribly boring and not for them. I found out that at school people don't get any kind of political education. This, I've met a lad who had two children who didn't even know what an electoral role was. He didn't know what a polling station was. Yeah? So if you think about the distance we have to travel. I also did a consultation um, with um, people with learning difficulties. And I met some people who were illiterate, who thought that because they couldn't read and write, it therefore meant they couldn't vote. You know, this is the real world of non-political um, engagement. And I was shocked, actually, about how bad it was and how negative people were about, um, about the whole process, but also how powerless a lot of those people felt. They felt that it wasn't about, you know, of course I heard that all politicians are liars and cheats, but also it was much more about, well, no one would listen to me anyway. So it wasn't that, oh, they're all bad, I'm great, whatever I tell them, they won't change their mind. I did hear that too. But it's also like, well, people like me never, no one ever listens to people like me. You know, people in power don't care about people like me. And that was the most depressing part of, of my time on the commission. So there's been some good news since we um, wrote the report. They set up a parliament, parliament, I think it's called Digital Service, that actually came out of a, a recommendation um, from um, the My Society report. Um, there's a really great e-petition site that's had um, over 7 million people have signed an online petition. And if 100,000 signatures go on a petition, it's then considered for debate in parliament, um, which is good because there is now a process. <laughs> You know, it's about trying to close that circle that, you know, before they just had petitions and then um, Parliament could just ignore it. Now it goes to the Petitions Committee. There's a heat map so you can see if people near you think the same things as you. Um, and one thing I particularly like is the Westminster Hall Cyber Chamber. Um, so, I mean, most of this is about Twitter and hashtags, and I, one of the things I hate is about, you know, Parliament going, oh, yeah, we're open, we've got a hashtag. Um, <laughs> um, but the Westminster Hall is about actually taking some of those um, uh, petitions into a debate in Westminster Hall. It's then promoted ahead of time with a hashtag so people can then get engaged. So it's beginning to close that circle. So you sign a petition, something happens, parliamentarians de debate it. Um, and also um, open Hansard, um, I think there's always been a willingness at Parliament to share data, but they haven't really made it very easy for people to use that data. And one other thing I can announce today is the Public Accounts Committee, which is the most powerful committee in Parliament have appointed me their specialist advisor for digital engagement. Um, <laughs> um, so, and after yesterday, I was thinking maybe some of you might like to help me. <laughs> um, and also because of all your academics, love all your data and everything, I was thinking maybe we should build some metrics in right from the start. So like I was saying before, let's bloody make sure that we make some difference. You know, if, if Meg Hillia, who's the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, wants to make the Public Accounts Committee more accountable, more transparent, but also to engage some of those people, the illiterate people, the, the lad in the fish and chip shop, actually think that the work that the Public Accounts Committee is relevant to them, 
then we need to make sure that we get our metrics right and that we know that it's working, otherwise we'll be wasting our time. So, who makes decisions that affect you? Who has the power and are they willing to share it? And I was surprised yesterday that I only heard the word power once. Um, is Kirsten here? Um, anyway, she gave a really great presentation. Um, and uh, because for me, this is the key. Politicians are not, I mean, in my experience in the UK, are not bad people. But they have worked hard to get to that position of power and they don't really want to share it. Too often, in my experience, the civic tech world say, I have a tool that can fix that. Oh, by the way, what was the problem? <laughs> you know? And I think a lot of you yesterday weren't talking in that way, which is great. But actually, too often, it's like, let's run away and build some. Oh, we've got some tech that could help with that without actually really botting out what the problem is. And unless you've been to the you know, your equivalent of the fish and chip shop and you've talked to those people who know absolutely nothing about a single thing that you're talking about, then you can work out what the real problem is and what the tool is that needs to be fixed. So this is what I always look at when I think about um, digital democracy um, and digital engagement. So those two lovely men are my sons. Um, and so everybody above the line, we can hopefully try and get to with some kind of digital tool, but everyone below the line, we can't because they're not digitally engaged. So um, Max, with the hat, is one of those young people who says, whatever I say, nothing makes any difference. Yeah? He only ever votes to vote the opposite way that I vote to annoy me because <laughs> he's my child. Um, my other son is um, doing PPE at uh, Manchester University and kind of feels the same way but from a position of great knowledge. Um, but so often the great success stories around civic tech in the UK are for Theo, my younger son. It's for the people who care about politics and who are very digitally literate, and I don't mean just those people who can put an attachment on an email. So for real action, we need people to be informed, involved, obviously included, engaged, and there needs to be real interaction. And this is the hard stuff because it's about getting out there and talking to people. So often technology is a bolt on the hashtag, yeah? And so actually, without systemic change, you know, one of the outcomes is going to be that our elected representatives will be overwhelmed. We do need, they do need better digital tools. There is a big problem there that needs fixing, but it's not social media training for, for politicians. But also, they need to do um, democracy differently. They need to want to care. They need to get up every morning and say, why are these people, why do 38% of the population not vote? Why do 95% of the people I represent never contact me? They're the questions that politicians really need to be asking. And it's hard. You know, like um, most politicians, no, I shouldn't say this, they don't. I was going to say most politicians most care about getting elected in the next election. That's not actually true. I think they really care about making a better society, most of them. Um, and therefore, to do that, they need real and ongoing engagement. And digital can help but it's not a silver bullet. It needs systems and partnerships and culture change. Um, and I think that that culture change is massively important. And I think that comes back to this problem about technology as a bolt-on. Too often we say, oh, just use this tool and then everything's going to be okay. But actually you need to change, you need to change what your first waking thought is, not you buy a tool because someone told you a word or cloud will change your life. So it's all about people. So real change can happen through co-creation that involves those in power, but also those with the least power. And those people with the least power are most likely to be digitally excluded. So you need to go and find them in that blend of offline and online. Digital can help that culture change that we so urgently need because it allows you to do more out in the open. It makes collaboration much easier. Um, and it also makes co-ownership, co-design, and co-funding a real possibility. Um, I said to um, 
a man, a senior public servant running uh, libraries in Manchester, amazing library in central Manchester. And um, I said, are you open on a Sunday? He said, no, I don't have enough money. And I said, well, if you set up a, a, a friends of your library, I'll give you, you know, 25 quid a month. And I'm sure lots of other people, not just in Manchester, would do that as well. We need to be much more willing and open about that co-funding debate. And actually, a digital technology can help us to do that. So our experience is it's not digital alone, and it has to be face-to-face. -face. Um, in the UK, there's 12.6 million people who don't know how to use technology properly. As we saw, there's 4.2 billion people around the world. So it has to be that blend of face-to-face, -face, but seeing that digital underpins it. So I, I don't think it's good enough to have an offline solution for those who are offline and an online solution for those who are online. I think actually we need to be seeing digital inclusion, digital literacy as a gateway to them being more included. So if you have a great digital tool, why not help those people who don't know how to use the internet at all to learn how to use the internet and then how to use your tool to then make the change that you want it to happen. And don't forget the 4.2 billion because otherwise you will be leaving them behind. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's fine. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to ask you about this uh, procedure of um, debating uh, in a Parliament. Uh, if there are uh, more than 100,000 uh, votes uh, by citizens, does there are any cases when it was the, uh, when it was uh, achieved this uh, amount of uh, votes? And what mini debate in your Parliament is it a draft law or, or something other? Okay. Thank you. Um, so nine. So so basically, if they get a hundred thousand um, signatures on the e-petition, then it goes to the petitions committee for a decision about whether or not it should go to a debate. Yeah, um, but that's not as silly as it sounds because some of it is about you know. A few of them have been about sacking ministers, for example, um, and that isn't you know really the thing that they do in Parliament. Um, so uh, the nine um, petitions have gone to a debate, and they either go into Westminster Hall, which is a side chamber, or they go into the main chamber. And a d debate means they talk about it. Okay, so they actually. In the main chamber, somebody presents an argument, other people will argue with it. So it's not a legislation, it's a debate, it's part of the process, you know, that may well lead to some legislative change later, but it's literally a debate where they talk about it. And none of them have actually led to any changes in law or anything yet, anyway. Hi, so... Um Actually, my favourite uh, my favourite petition was uh, the Stop Donald Trump yeah. Coming to the UK yeah. petition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, which had the same number of votes as Close All Borders to Migrants, you know, so it just goes to show there's people on both sides of the debate. Uh, no, I, I actually wanted to ask a bit more about, um, again, your time on the, the commission. Cause one of the things that, that we find is that, you know, we can provide the tool, and, and it's supposed to be a means to an end, as, as you said, um, but one of the barriers is when politicians themselves fail to be responsive. So we can build the tool, we can get people to come to the tool, um, but we can't make MPs respond, we can't make, you know, we, we just can't do that. We have a, a list, we, we send out a list every year of who's responsive and who's yeah. not, but, you know, how, how do we kind of get that push back the other end? Um. Obviously, I can't ever say anything bad about my society because everything you do is perfect and brilliant. Um, so, uh, I think that it kind of comes back to what's the point, and I guess this is about par partnership, and I think this is where when I was saying that digital can help you to do more out in the open. But actually, I think that the problem is we need to have a dialogue with those, pe with those politicians about what your tools are doing that helps them to do their job and to achieve the things that they want to achieve. And I think without that dialogue, um, those politicians might think that you're more of an annoyance than you are a help, yeah? Um, and I think that that's a really difficult divide that you have to cross. Um, I think that... Uh, 
I, I don't think that we've brought politicians the burning platform yet, yeah? And, you know, maybe we need to take more of them out to the fish and chip shops and the, um, go talk to the illiterate people that came to the um, round table at Chesterfield Library. You know, that actually getting out of the Westminster bubble, I think, is the most important thing. I think, though, that I would also say that you can have a reply, but it's pretty rubbish. You know, my MP, I am appalled by the poor quality of the reply. It always sounds nice, you know, three paragraphs, he gives me the fours and the fours and against, but he doesn't tell me what he thinks, how he's going to vote. He doesn't actually say that he's going to take anything that I've said to him into account, but, you know, that would be a tick in the box. I got an email reply, you know, my email to him, he sent me a template back, tick, done. But actually that wasn't a real dialogue. So I think that we've got to create a burning platform. We've got to say, you've got to reply to the people who... Um, who, who uh, um, write to you. One of the things that we try to do, so on the commission there were eight people and five of us were independent and I think all of the independents um, thought that we should have a job description for MPs, for example. Um, they don't have one. We got shouted down on that. Um, wasn't possible. Um, so there's no obligation for them to reply to their constituents. But I think it's about having that debate, like getting them in a room even the maybe your worst offenders getting them in the room, um, and uh, and then talking to them about you know what do they want to achieve, you know. And I think actually if you did some work, for example, with an organisation like mine, um, about trying to reach those people who don't vote, who don't care, who don't think it's for them, then maybe the politicians would think it's more interesting. Because if they think it's just, you know, Theo up in the top right-hand corner who already cares about politics and is already engaged and is already digitally literate, then they might think that there's really no point in your tools, yeah? Because they think that they've got all the channels they need and they're going to contact them. So I think it's about that debate and making sure that the tool is fixing their problem as well as your problem, yeah? Thanks. Um, my name is Alice. I'm from a company that does technology for elections around the world. And I got two questions. Um, one was um, from the kind of, you know, our experience. We often look to places like Estonia as examples of where there's kind of strong digital democracy. Um, I just wondered what, in your work with the Commission, if there are particular examples you'd point to that you think, you know, are doing it really well, and what can we learn from them? And as the second part of that is, how optimistic are you about the kind of and I know there's been quite a lot of progress on quite a few of the recommendations, the five recommendations. If you were going to say there's one that, oh, you know, I'm definitely I'm sure it's going to say one I'm not so sure about, what would kind of your predictions be for whether they'll be realised or not? Um, I mean, I'm sure you guys probably know more than me, but I mean, Estonia, the Iceland example. Um, I hate to say it though, and I am a massively optimistic person, my glass is always half full. But a lot of the best examples don't include the people I most care about including. You know, and that even though they're kind of representative and they randomly sample people and they make it really open and they invite everybody, it still doesn't get to that hardest to reach. So, for example, in my digital inclusion work in the UK, there's 12.6 million people we want to get to. By 2020, we predict that if we keep going the way we're going and do all the fabulous work that we do, there'll still be 6 million people who won't have the basic digital skills that they need. And so what we've done is we've done a really thorough analysis of who they are and we're working with them now. I think that's exactly the same thing we have to do around digital democracy and democratic engagement. We have to work out who are those people who are really, 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 really hard and let's make sure we're helping and focusing on them. Because the people in the middle, they need the tools, but they're going to find it themselves. And I guess this is partly my comment about um, the you know, pastimes of the middle classes, is that you know, in my neighbourhood, the council cutting down the trees, the, the very well-educated, digitally enabled middle classes have mounted an amazing campaign and crowdsourced money to take the council to court and, you know, lots and lots of online petitioning, etc., etc. Because when they've got a problem, they know how to use those tools and they know how to, how to get organised. They're not the people we most care about. Um, so I'm kind of going, there aren't any. Yeah, so you know, go do it. You know, go find those hard to reach people. Um, the thing I, I don't think that online voting is going to happen. You know, I think that there was too much pushback from 
people who knew a lot about technology, I mean, whether they were right or wrong, who said that it's not secure and um, it's not going to improve things dramatically. Um, I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> we found a lot of evidence that particularly young people would be much more motivated to vote if there was online voting. Um, but uh, it's interesting, there's quite a lot of, of um, you know, well-educated people saying, do we want all these not well-educated people to be able to vote really easily on their mobile phone, as if there's some kind of paternalistic right to voting or not. Um, and so I think there's a really diversive debate around around that rather than I think it should be about and this is what the commission says in the in the report about doing pilots and actually working it out and working out what the reality is before we say it's not going to work but there's too many people and it will actually require a les legislative change as well so um, it's unlikely to get through the House of Commons as well uh, this is a uh, William Perrin from Talk About Local. This is a very loaded question because I'm on Helen's board um, <laughs> at the Tinder Foundation. Um, uh, one, uh, my Society North America gave a good presentation yesterday where they said that five government, I think it was five, government-sponsored civic tech tools, of five of them, only one of them had any attempt to engage people who were not um, online or already in the target audience. Now, it's, you and I have discussed this, Helen, but given this audience here of people from all over the world running civic tech projects, is this the sort of thing Tinder Foundation would be prepared to partner with if someone was putting together a proposal to do a civic tech project in a given country and wanted to have as a component of that outreach to people who are not online or indeed to people who are not actually in the automatic um, pale mail, stale thing, whatever it was, uh, target <laughs> audience that tends, middle class target audience that tends to do this kind of thing in the first place? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's a really good point, and I think this is why I said about um, blending digital literacy with the rollout of, of a democratic tool or a civic tech tool, is that, um, that I think at least one of the examples, there was an offline channel and there was an online channel, you know, to do the same thing, and they were both an improvement, so you know the offline bit was an improvement to what was there before, but it wasn't saying we're going to help those offline people to use the online tool, because online tool is actually much better. And the example I gave around people getting jobs was because it, we weren't, we're not an employment project. Yeah, we're a project which is about empowering people to use the internet to change their lives in whatever way they want to do it. And therefore, it almost doesn't matter what the channel is, and actually civic engagement would be a perfect would be a perfect one to do. I think that there is there is a double divide though, because of what I said about so many people I met when I was on the commission who don't think that politics or civic engagement is anything to do with them. So you don't just have to persuade them that they can be part of the digital society that they think other people do, not people like them. You also have to persuade them that being part of some kind of democratic process is also for people like them too. And so, I mean, and, and that's, the, that's the real reason why Tinder Foundation isn't doing anything that combines the civic tech and the digital inclusion right now. One, we, we haven't got partners who've approached us, but the second one is it's really hard. You know, if you take people who really are suffering many, many different challenges and have complex lives to persuade them that actually this alien, foreign, distant, irrelevant body called parliament and government has anything to do with them. Um, or even just, you know, the you know, in Sheffield, when they cut down the trees in the poor bit of town, there wasn't a Facebook group for it. You know, when they cut down the trees on the wealthy bit of town, everyone's up in arms and there's social media rampage going on. Yeah? And so that's the reality. This is really hard because you're trying to persuade people they want to do two different things that they don't think that people like them are ever going to be engaged with. Um, I did um, tell uh, Winter, I think, over dinner about on Facebook, um, one of the only example I've got where, where I've been proved wrong on this is the... Um, the fish and chip shop in Stockport, you can tell, is one of my favourite partners. Um, and uh, they uh, are on a precinct in a really poor part of the north of England. And the uh, Iceland, a supermarket, took over the car park and started charging one pound. But one pound was too much for the poor people of Stockport. Um, and so the woman who runs the um, UK Online Centre in the fish and chip shop um, set up a Facebook group 
took people who were offline, taught them how to use Facebook so that they could go onto the Facebook group, taught them how to use email so they could email their counsellors because they were so angry that this car park was going to charge them some money. And so that's the only example that I know of where offline people who are angry about something that the council had done, e.g. sell a car park to the supermarket, actually got up, got organised and got online in order to do that campaigning. We've got time for one more question. Hi, I'm Rosie McGee from the Institute of Development Studies. Um, the world I work in is mainly developing countries, so it's really interesting to hear this about the UK. Um, I'm just wondering, so in, in development studies literature, there's a lot to tell us that the main resource that poor, marginalised, excluded people have is their numbers and is the strength that can come from collective action rather than individual action. And so one of the concerns I have about some of the approaches to using technologies for civic engagement are that a lot of them tend to individualise rather than collectivise. And I just wondered from what you've been saying, does the Tinder Foundation have a position on that and what would, what would your view be on that one? Um, it's a really good question. I mean, I think that you know, the blend of, of the local and the face-to-face -face and the digital is obviously, I would always recommend as a way of making that change happen because it is that collective support that people are providing with one another plus the digital is then the tools that you're using in order to for you to be more empowered and more enabled um i think that i mean i would argue that things like facebook groups are not that individualistic because you're collaborating with other people you're seeing what other people are saying about an issue that you care about and then you can you can then recomment to them so it depends that, uh, and I think some of the tools, you know, like the e-petitions website saying, you know, you can see what people near you are, are, are signing at the moment. I think some of these tools are helping with some of that um, c collaboration. I mean, I would say though that I'm sure you're right and I'm sure that is what the research shows. However, te digital technology has the enormous power of bringing people together and enabling them to collaborate with other people who have the same views as them and who um, want to see the same change as them. And therefore, um, I would say that we ought to be supporting you know, things like simple things like Facebook groups and, and also making sure that this blend of face-to-face of -face and digital happens um, you know, when, when you're putting forward those programs. So much.